At least 140 billion men, women, and children have lived and died on planet Earth. They were all different, yet in one respect they were all very much alike. I'll be back in a moment with the amazing facts. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. You know, it's estimated that 140 billion human beings have lived on Earth since the beginning of time. But life came to an end for each one of those people, and for all of us also, because we must enter the portals of the grave someday. Death may not be a pleasant thought. Few look forward to it, of course, with any kind of anticipation. Millions, in fact, fear the very thought of death. It's said that Louis the fourth, when ascending to the throne of France, saw through the windows of his palace the church of St. Denis, where his ancestors lay buried. The very thought that someday he too must be buried along with those who had gone on before haunted him, and he could not bear to look on that final resting place. Therefore he ordered that another building be erected to separate the palace from the church to hide it from his sight. While this, of course, did not forestall his death because he joined that great caravan of those who, as the poet put it, silently steal away. Friends, what does happen to a man when he dies? And why does it matter? The confusion in men's minds today indicate our need to have a revelation from God. And so, as our policy has been here on Amazing Facts broadcast, we're going to turn to the Bible, and I hope just pare away all the man-made paraphernalia that's been attached to this great truth, and ask again, what says the Bible, the blessed Bible? This should my only question be. Teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the blessed book to me? All right, our first text today is one of the clearest texts anywhere in Scripture describing what happens when a man dies. It says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. That's in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Now it tells us, first of all, what happens to the physical part of man, the dust, the elements of which he's composed. Why, that decomposes, doesn't it, and returns back again to the earth. We know that, of course. What happens to the other part? It says, And the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now listen, is this spirit then some disembodied something that looks like you and thinks like you and can walk through a door without opening it? Just what is a spirit that returns to God? It seems that if we can define our terms here, it's going to clarify immensely the question to which we are addressing ourselves. A good place to begin is here in the New Testament. Look at James 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead... Now, we begin to get a little picture here of what the Bible means when it uses the term spirit. It says the body without the spirit is dead. All right, then the spirit must be the life principle, that spark of life which God places in man to make him alive. Incidentally, the word in the New Testament from which the word spirit comes is the Greek word pneuma, from which we get pneumatic tire and pneumonia. You see, those things have to do with air or the breath. And in Job 27, 3, it says, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Now here you see Job using these two terms interchangeably, breath and spirit. And we discover that they are all translated from the very same word, the word pneuma, which means either breath or spirit. Now what have we discovered thus far? that when a man dies, his body decays, and his spirit returns to God who gave it. We found that spirit is the breath of life, or the spark of life, or that life principle with which God endows man so that it makes him live. Now, to the book of Genesis for the most concise description anywhere of how God put men together in the beginning. In Genesis 2, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now notice, that we put these verses together without any interpretation, what we immediately discover. Man is created of the dust of the earth, and that dust is made alive when God puts into it the breath of life, or the spark of life, or spirit. Now could anything be more clear than that, friends? 
Now let me ask you a question. True or false? Man has a living soul. The answer lies in our Genesis text. Man became a living soul. Did God take a living soul and put it into man? No, no, it doesn't say that at all. Man does not have a living soul. He is a living soul. Now, how did the soul come about? It was the result of the union of the body and the spirit or breath of life. When God put those two things together, then man became a living soul. Now, friend, it makes all the difference in the world that we understand the Bible's use of these three terms, the body, spirit, and soul. Please notice carefully that it takes a body and a spirit to make a living soul. One plus one equals two. That's not just good arithmetic, it's also good theology. When we put the physical form which God made from the dust of the earth with that life principle, the gift of life, then man becomes a living soul. What happens when, he, uh, when uh, uh, these things uh, come apart, friends? What happens when the man dies and these things separate? Well, we discovered what happens to the body. That decays and returns to the dust. No problem there. And what happens to the spirit? Why, it returns to God. That gift of life that was entrusted to man is recalled, and he no longer is alive. How does the spirit look? Why, it doesn't look like anything, friends. It is the spark of life. Ah, you say, but what happens to the soul? Well, in Ezekiel 18, 4, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In other words, when man stops living, he's dead. That may sound like a trite statement, but really it isn't. When man comes apart, his body decays, God recalls the life principle, and he who is a living soul, because of the union of these two things, ceases to live. Now let me illustrate. Let's say here's a pile of boards and here's a pile of nails. Now we could put them together just right and make a box. The box is a result of the union of these two things. Now when we pull out the nails, where does the box go? You say, well, it doesn't go anywhere. It just isn't anymore. You must have the boards and the nails together to get the box. Of course, you're right. And friends, you must have a body and the spirit of life together to get a living soul. When we take those two things apart, we no longer have a living soul. Now, you see, when we define our terms and let the Bible explain itself, it becomes so crystal clear that we need not go astray. The Bible speaks of a resurrection, future. But what purpose would there be in a resurrection if, when men die, they went immediately to their rewards? The Bible speaks of a judgment, future. But what purpose would there be in a judgment if the rewards were handed out when a man died? The Bible speaks of the second coming of Jesus, future. But what purpose would there be in a second coming of Christ if, when a man died, he went on to his eternal reward? The word mortal actually means subject to death, capable of dying. The word immortal means not subject to death. Now, if when a man dies, he really isn't dead at all, he just goes somewhere else and goes on living, then man is really immortal, isn't he? 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, speaking of God, says, God who only hath immortality. Then, friends, God is the only one who has that immortality. God is the only one who is not subject to death. And the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, the wise man wrote in Ecclesiastes 9.5. When a man dies, he doesn't go to heaven. When a man dies, he doesn't go to hell. When a man dies, he doesn't go anywhere. He's dead, and he ceases to be alive. Someday, when Jesus comes, he'll receive the gift of immortality if he's among the righteous. Jesus said that when a man dies, he goes to sleep. John 11.13. And this is one of the most precious passages left from the entire ministry of our Lord. Sometimes we read over it quite quickly and lose some of its significance. Let's read it. Therefore his sisters, that is of Lazarus, sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. All right, now these girls, Mary and Martha, wanted Jesus to come and heal their brother, who was Jesus' friend. However, you'll remember, Jesus didn't come right away, and Lazarus died. Verse 11, he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. 
Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a breast and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now notice here that Jesus likened death to a sleep. Now notice verse 23. Jesus saith unto her, this is to Martha, Thy brother shall rise again. Notice that Martha had her theology straight because she replies in the next verse, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now Jesus did not correct her. She was right in what she said. Jesus went out then to the grave, asked that the stone be rolled away from the mouth of the grave. In verse 39, Martha was afraid that it would be an embarrassing experience for all of them, for her brother had been dead for four days, and already she knew that decomposition had begun. By this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Now there was no question but that Lazarus was dead. Verse 43, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Why not? Because Lazarus had not gone anywhere in those four days. He was in the grave asleep. Friend, if Jesus calls, called Lazarus back from glory, he played a terribly cruel trick on one of the closest friends he ever had. Anyway, why doesn't Lazarus give them a Bible study on the glories of heaven or the torments of hell? What an impressive first-hand account he could have given. Except for one significant fact, he hadn't been there. He had been only in the grave. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, the Bible says. Jesus said he had been asleep. There's something else in the text also that's thrilling to me. When Jesus thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why he said, Lazarus, come forth? If he had said simply, come forth, every grave on that Bethany hillside would have been open. That's the power of the life giver, friends, that we serve. Lazarus, come forth. That's the same call of victory that's going to ring around this old world someday soon when Jesus comes to claim his own. I read of this man, David, who's called in Scripture a man after God's own heart. Now, that's a fine compliment, by the way, wouldn't you say? I'd like to have that epitaph, too. Surely, with an evaluation like that, we can know that David will be granted eternal life when the rewards are given out. But what does the Bible say about him? In Acts 2, verses 29 and 34, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. For David is not ascended into the heavens. Now this is Peter talking two thousand, a thousand years after David has died. And he says that David has not gone to heaven. He's in his tomb. He's resting in the grave. Why did he say that, friends? Because there isn't a man that has gone on to heaven, uh, except the one who was translated in the Old Testament. When a man dies, he does not go to heaven or hell. He goes to the grave where he rests until Jesus calls him forth. And so David was in his grave, even though he was a good man, and even though he will be saved at last. And that's where all good people go and wait for the resurrection.